Hey there, invertebrate zoology class. Um, welcome to the first of uh, a few video installments uh, to finish us out for this class. I'll be doing all of our lectures as videos from now on so you can watch them um, whenever you're available to while we're all in quarantine. Um, I bet you thought we were done with worms. We are not. So let's talk about a very different group of worms today. So let's talk about the Nemertians or the Phylum Nemertia. Um, I'll explain what's going on in this video in a little bit. Now, normally on this next slide, you'd see my learning goals. I have uploaded my PowerPoints onto Schoology, and there you can see the learning goals for um, working on your study guide for the exams. We'll keep that the same. Um, but I'm not going to put them online in the videos. So you can fill out that study guide while you watch the videos. First, let's go back to um, the phylogeny that we looked at at the beginning of the semester. So again, this is the phylogeny that we constructed based on that 2020 paper looking at the Kingdom Animalia. This is where the Nemertia are. It's right here, a sister group to the mollusks. These are not worms like annelids, and they are not worms like nematodes. Um, they're completely phylogenetically separate. Um, common names for Nemertians are ribbon worms or bootlace worms, as you can see from these pictures I've included here. Um, they, you can tell they're distinct from annelids because they're unsegmented. Annelids are segmented worms. There's about 1,300 described species. Most of these species are marine. Um, and they are not nematodes. Their name may be very similar to nematodes, but nematians are a completely separate group. Um, and here's just a little showcase of the biodiversity that's within the nematians. Just a little bit, let's talk a little bit about their ecology. Um, most of these worms are free living and they're benthic, which means they live kind of near the bottom of um, open water systems. Like I said, they're mostly marine, so this is mostly in open ocean systems. Um, some of them can be commensal with other invertebrates. There are a few species that are parasitic. Um, for the most part, they are found in shallow water where they'll glide along the substrate, they'll hide under rocks and algae, um, or they'll burrow into soft sediments. And for the most part, um, while some are parasitic and some are commensal with other invertebrates, for the most part, this group is um, predatory carnivores. As you can see in this GIF that I've included here, and I'm going to uh, include another link to this video at the end of this. Um, this uh, guy, Bruno, has a bunch of really cool videos of Nemertians on YouTube that I um, am going to suggest you watch. And I'll include links on Schoology for you to watch, too. Um, most Nemertians are specialist carnivores. What that means is that they'll eat um, only a certain particular species or they will only eat a particular type. So there are some Nemertians like this one that's eating this annelid worm here. Uh, some of them only eat annelid worms. Some of them only eat crustaceans. Some of them will only eat a certain species. So that's what I mean when I say that they're a specialist carnivore. Some can be really, really small um, that you need to see with a microscope, and some of them are really, really large. Uh, Linnaeus longissimus can be over 50 meters in length. That is a really long worm. And while I was trying to find pictures of this species online, I found this really weird child's story about a boy who finds a 200-foot-long worm in his parents' library and befriends it. So if you want to read this real weird child story I found, it's available on Amazon. So let's talk a little bit about their general body plan um, and some of their characteristics. Um, there's only one unifying synapomorphy that I would like you to be able to recall for the exam, and that's that they have an anterior proboscis that's held within this cavity called the rinkocele. So the rinkocele is a fluid-filled cavity that holds the proboscis. Um, and when I first saw videos of it everting its proboscis like it is in this video and in this one, this is a species that happens to have um, a highly branched proboscis. 
um, that it's everting here. This one has a less branch proboscis that it's using to capture um, this polychaete worm. When I first saw videos of this, it reminded me of the monster from Alien. <laughs> Obviously, it's very different, but that's why I included that gif here. Um, and they have a real creepy nightmare tongue. So their proboscis or their tongue, they evert with fluid pressure. So when both of these worms are averting their tongue, they're using fluid pressure to expel it. Like if you were to um, fill a, a rubber glove with water and it would make all the projections blow out. That's basically what's happening here. And then when they want to retract that tongue back in, um, they use their muscle contractions to retract their tongue. Um, horrifyingly enough, some of them have a um, piercing stylet that's at the end of their tongue. So basically it's a tongue with a razor blade on the end of it. And that stylet is uh, made of calcium, which is why it's called a calcareous piercing stylet. Um, so some of them have a razor sharp stylet at the end of their nightmare tongue. And some of them um, will just secrete a sticky mucus with their proboscis that they will then use to trap prey. Um, usually the ones that have a stylet, sometimes the ones that have a stylet will also secrete a um, paralytic neurotoxin into their prey. So when they stab them with the stylet at the end of their tongue, they'll also secrete a neurotoxin. Um, another terrifying thing they can do with their weird tongue is that they can coil it around their prey and then they stab it again um, just to make sure it's really dead before they pull it back into their mouth and digest it. So the two main strategies that they have is that they can um, pierce their prey with the stylet or they'll secrete a sticky mucus with their proboscis and use that to trap prey. So two equally horrifying strategies for obtaining prey. Let's talk a little bit more about their anatomy. Um, they have a ventral anterior mouth. That mouth then leads into something called a stomodium or buccal cavity, which we've heard that word before. That basically means cheek. So it's the internal cavity that they bring it into. Um, and then they have an esophagus. And then they have their um, intestines, their proctoduum or their rectum, which is all the way down here. So they've got these digestive cecum here. Um, this is their tongue and their rinca seal. So the tongue is pulled into that rinca seal, that fluid filled cavity. Um, the digestive cecum are working to digest their food once they pull it in. And then here's their intestine, works their way out through their anus. Um, their intestines can have many diverticula. That's that word here. These are projections that are lying the intestine that increase the surface area of the intestine so that they can have um, higher absorption rates within the intestine. And in terms of gas exchange, um, this is something that they share with the annelids is that most of their gas exchange is through um, diffusion through the body surface. Um, or by flushing water in and out of their foregut. So they bring in water through their mouth, through their buccal cavity, and then they flush it back out again. And because their um, foregut is lined with lots of blood vessels, they can then essentially do gas exchange with the water by flushing it in and out of their mouth. So those are the two strategies that they have for gas exchange. In terms of reproduction and their life cycle, they are gonochoristic, which means that they have um, separate sexes and separate individuals. So again, gonochoristic means that they have separate sexes and separate individuals. Um, most ribbon worms will reproduce sexually and are gonochoristic. Um, some of them are sequential hermaphrodites um, and specifically they are prodandric hermaphrodites. And what prodandric means is that they are male first and then they are female. So I'll say that again, prodandric hermaphrodites are hermaphrodites that are male first and then they become li female later in life. Um, a lot of them, some, the ones that are not, that don't have separate sexes, the ones that are not gonochoristic um, are protandric hermaphrodites. Um, they'll have serial repeated gonads and external fertilization. So this is something that is uh, different from a lot of the annelid groups that we talked about is that they will have external instead of internal fertilization. Um, 
they do uh, release their gametes in kind of similar ways to some of the annelid groups that we talked about where they'll just rupture through their body wall um, or sometimes they'll have temporary ducts for releasing their gametes into the water. Sometimes they'll mate in like a gross writhing mass um, and this is something else they share so I think that's what's going on in this picture here and in here is that sometimes they'll form like a writhing mass for mating and in that writhing mass they will secrete a mucus that protects, it, protects their gametes as they externally fertilize um, which is similar to what we talked about um, specifically for the, for the Harudineids, the leeches that we talked about previously. Um, but they don't always do this. Sometimes they'll just release their gametes into the water. Um, and sometimes they do have a larval stage that's called a pilidium. These are just some examples from a research paper of the different larval stages that you can see in different groups of Nemertians. So again, the larval stage of the Nemertians is called the pilidium. And I thought I'd just um, add to what you've been reading in your textbook on this group by looking up some current research papers on Nemertians. Um, one really cool study that I found was a phylogenetic survey that showed that there were multiple different groups that could regenerate their heads. They're, so if you read this paper, they're all, almost all Nemertians can regenerate their posterior segments or their butt segments if they lose them. That's a really common feature of the group but there are a few groups that can also regenerate their head regions. Um, and it seems like this uh, evolutionary novelty has happened multiple times in different, different, in different groups of Nemertians. And if any of you have ever seen Men in Black, uh, you'll get this gift that I included. Sorry if it's terrifying. Another really cool paper that I found was that um, there's a population of this one species of... Um, Nemertians that I included pictures of here. It's actually, a, I think it's really pretty, um, ribbon worm, um, that's uh, found in Southeast Asia. There's a certain population that has no females. The, the way that they reproduce is they just break off segments of themselves and then those segments regenerate into a fully formed worm again, which is really crazy and really cool. Um, so, so even though most of them reproduce sexually and they're gonochoristic where they have the separate sexes, there are these weirdo populations that reproduce asexually. Um, I don't know. I think this worm kind of looks like candy. Um, and then there's this other really cool paper that um, found that there were symbiotic relationships between this one group of Nemertians and this other group of uh, chinoderms, these uh, sea urchins. So. First recorded case of that in 2018. Um, yeah, there's not actually a ton of people working on these groups, and we've talked about this before, is that if you are looking, if the thing that really excites you about biology is finding out new things about the world that no one's ever known before, studying really weird, obscure groups like Nemertine and Ribbon Worms is a great way to find new things. Um, and I am going to assign some extra videos for you to watch. Usually, if we were in the classroom, I'd just show these in class, but I'm not going to steal a bunch of YouTube videos to put in my own YouTube video. So, um, this is a really great video from the Smithsonian Tropical Research in Institute with an interview with a Nemertian biologist, and it's really, really great. This other video is from um, Bruno Velotini. This guy's got, a, he, I think he actually studies Nemertians too because he's got a lot of really cool videos of them eating polychaete worms on YouTube that you should check out. And then we've watched a, a bunch of videos from Growth Science before. Um, check out this really cool video of um, from Growth Science on ribbon worms too. So I'll post links to all three of these on Schoology, but make sure you watch all three of these too for additional learning. Um, so that's it. That concludes this first video lecture for the rest of the semester. I'll try to spice them up as much as I can. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any questions, please post in the discussion boards on Schoology um, and we'll keep like a running tally of questions on there. Um, for prepping for the exams. Okay, tune in next time. Bye-bye.
Worms. Ribbon worms. Worms. Ribbon worms. Ribbon worms.